Good evening and welcome to our online observance of Monday Thursday. Each service of the Paschal to Doom this year is going to have its unique flavor, so to speak, as we are not in our church building. We will be in various homes starting this evening in mine and tomorrow evening we'll be with Christopher and on Saturday evening we'll be with Matthew. And each of us has taken a little bit of time to pray and put together what we hope is a meaningful and sometimes personal substitute, uh, if that word could be applied, to what is a beautiful and magnificent liturgy when it unfolds in the church setting. So this evening on Monday, Thursday, we are going to begin with the traditional collect for that day. Normally the service would begin with the celebration of the Eucharist and following that, the procession to the chapel and the preparation of the altar for, for Good Friday. This prayer sets the tone for the institution of the Last Supper which we're not able to celebrate together, except in some part in ourselves. And I would invite us all to reflect and ponder a time of Eucharist, a time of holy thanksgiving, where one felt particularly near to God and when the communion of the saints felt particularly close. And we will begin with this prayer. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may always remember this in his name, who with these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A very small portion of my own preparation in getting ready for Monday, Thursday and indeed for each season of the church year, is to put out on my dining room table a small display that reflects the seasons of the year. And what I would like to do for the next few minutes is to share with you how I make that transition in my home from Lent to Easter uh, in the dining room, which is where we are now. And Following that, I will conclude with a meditation on the institution of the Last Supper itself. So this is going to be a bit of a challenge technologically. Um, I'm going to ask Christopher if you would like to open up the ability for you to speak if you'd like to do so. You're going to have to unmute your own computer but you are invited to say whatever you would like to reflect how you do this yourself, ask questions as to how things go. But this is Paul getting ready for Easter. I have uh, around my place a series of uh, chests like this and each chest in it has a little plaque I had made for it with the season of the year. And when a season comes around, I try to be very deliberate and open the chest that is the season past and reverently put away things. And I believe how we store things, there's a lot of it about how we actually approach the objects that they are. So each of the chests that I have has a rather unique sort of flavor inside. 
or theme inside of how we even pack things. Uh, to start off, uh, we are moving from lead to Easter. So we start with lead. And I have a chest here, which is the lead chest. And the lead chest is primarily empty at this point. And I'm going to pan the camera over so you can see it. So the lead chest is primarily empty right now, but what it has inside are a bunch of pieces of fabric that are used to hold the display that is lent for me. Um, lent has a lot of different thematic elements spiritually that go on, and I like every time I walk into the dining room noticing uh, what they are. So let's take this apart. Let's look at it for a moment before we do. Um, the lent display is primarily made up of icons and willow fronds. Um, those of you who have been part of St. Mark's for a while know of my passion for icons, and I have preached a number of sermons on the icons that are in this particular display, and we're not going to get into them now. Um, so we'll take out the Willow here. Willow is a symbol of new life. If we go outside, we find ourselves inundated with beauty as we look around and see all the absolutely wonderful, wonderful things that nature and God has given us to celebrate the coming of spring. So I'm going to take and wrap up these fronds in some linen fabric here. I have an icon that I didn't use this year. I try to keep a series of icons available so that I can change them out as the setup for Lent mood or spiritual place tends to touch me each year. And tie together this rather rustic bundle of willow. Next, I have a series of linens that we use to house the icons. I'm going to take the largest icon out, which is Christ the Savior, our oldest image of Jesus that we have. And we have St. George as well tonight, or I should say this year, Rublov's Holy Trinity, an icon of a small one of St. Paul, St. Michael the Archangel, and then if you were sitting on the other side of the dining room table, you would be looking at two icons, St. Benedict and his sister Scholastica, known for their academic pursuits, as well as the visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary on the Feast of the Annunciation. So we have all of these icons that we prepared to get ready to put in the box as well. Now, you probably heard a little clink when I did that, and that's because there's a very small little egg hidden in the bottom amidst a piece of cotton, 
which symbolizes snow. And the idea is the willow fronds come out of the snow just as new life emerges. And an egg is symbolic of new life. And this is a very little, very small hand painted egg. So I'm going to wrap the egg up and I am going to put it inside here like this. So we have our fronds, our eggs, our icons, which I didn't quite do correctly. Do our icons like this. We have some burlap here, which is also a very rustic thing. We have about the middle of the burlap. We have a lighter piece of burlap, and this is what we put our piece in. And I'm just going to be very unceremonial here and put that on the ground or the actually dining room table, as the case may be. And Put this in here like this. And our icons fit down in there for protection. And this goes back in the chest like this. And wrapped over like that. And then we keep that nice and warm until next length when the snow will be on the ground. We unpack things one more time. I'm going to tie up our egg here. We'll put our willow fronds back in place with the egg like that. And our icon of Christ the Savior from Mr. Rublov once again, and we'll see if that one makes it next year into our chest. And we'll just put the chest back together as best we can there. And I file that in a bookcase downstairs where all of the seasonal chests go. So the next chest, after the Lent chest is done, of course is the Easter chest. And we saw that beautiful little egg in there. We have a piece of damask here. Inside the damask, what do we have? We have all these little white bundles. These white bundles are not pieces of cotton or snow, but they can remind us of a world that was only a few months ago under wraps, and also a world that is waiting to be unwrapped and revealed to its fullest extent through the gift of Christ and God's will for us. So a lot of these little bundles. And then inside that, there I have a, each of the displays has a piece of glassware this glassware kind of looks like a gigantic martini dish. And it kind of, it kind of is because what I'm going to put in it are a series of hand painted, very beautiful Russian 
Easter eggs that I got over my many travels to that country. I only put a few in today, but I'll just show you how beautiful they are and to imagine those long Russian winter nights when people sat in front of the fireplace and hand painted these exquisite eggs. And for Russians, eggs have always been symbolic of Easter, symbolic of resurrection. And if we take a moment, we can think about exactly why that might be the case. The potential within this egg for something new, for something reborn, for life to come, and certainly an occasion to give thanksgiving. For Monday is about thanksgiving. The very word Monday comes from the word mundahum, which is Latin, which means commandment. And Christ gave us several commandments. Christ commanded us to love God and to love one another. And traditionally, the church has expressed that great love and following that commandment in several different ways. One way is the church has, at this time, placed an emphasis on reaching out to the poor and helping them bring change and new life into their lives. I'm sure that given the current health crisis, the traditional giving in England of the, the monarch, the Monday purse in Scotland is often done at St. Giles Cathedral by the monarch of England. It goes way back to Elizabethan times and could be before that, I don't know. When the monarch gave funds to the poor, Christ, of course, commands us in loving one another. To express that love in a number of different ways, the church has expressed it historically in two ways. Some churches on Monday, Thursday, have the ceremony of the foot washing. And we hear that beautiful, beautiful gospel story where Christ washes the feet of the disciples and is a servant in their midst. Well, I'm just going to sort of pause here. Let's solve the unwrapping. The second way the church has remembered this commandment over the years is the commandment that Christ gave at the Eucharist to do this in remembrance of me, which is celebrating the Holy Eucharist. And that is why on Monday, Thursday, we call the Monday, Thursday Eucharistic service the institution of the Last Supper. And often we read that beautiful passage where Christ assembles in the upper room with the disciples and the night before he died and institutes the sacrament, one of the two great sacraments of the Church of the Last Supper. Well, it's always a clergy's prerogative to change their mind. They're going to keep going until I finally finish. Does anyone want to unmute themselves and have a, a comment or a question at this point? Last that's chance. Good. That's, that's the nicest looking collection of olives in that martini glass that oh, oh my I goodness. think I've ever seen. <laughs> that's just lovely. Thank you for unwrapping all of them. Well, you're welcome. If you were here to see them close up, you could see that the, they vary considerably 
as to the artist, as to how they approach their painting. Some are using extremely fine brushes. Others have a more sweeping style. But over the years, it's been fascinating to compile a very diverse collection, not only in diversity in color, but diversity in expression, in style, in how they come together um, in one symbolic of bursting forward into new life. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that the chapel where we house the Holy Sacrament um, has white flowers and it has five red roses in it for the five wounds of Christ, which is very evocative of what's going to happen on Saturday night with the, there's five incense pegs in the new Paschal candle. But in Russia, they often use five red Easter eggs. It's traditional numbers to have five, I'm told, in many homes, um, to represent that also, that Christ's sacrifice is what brings us life in, in that particular theological expression. And today, we follow that commandment by giving holy thanksgiving to God for that gift of hope that is about to make itself known as Holy Week unfolds and Easter Sunday arrives. I'm going to move the camera one more time over to um, an area where I'm going to share with you a meditation on Monday, Thursday. And I'll do that. And All right. This book is entitled The Shape of the Liturgy. It was written by a monk many years ago. And, and there's a beautiful passage that's often used as a meditation on retreats when thinking about the Holy Eucharist. And it's three relatively good sized paragraphs. And I will jump around a little bit so that it, it doesn't seem too laborious this evening for us because the last thing I want to do is weigh ourselves down because Lent is all about the expectation in the beginning of something fresh, something eternal that we only see a glimmer of now, but will manifest itself. And seeking the glimmer of hope and freshness and eternity um, amidst very challenging times is one that we're in. And the monk who wrote this, wrote it in a time of national crisis. Uh, this book was first published in 1945. So another world with a shadow over it, but a world still full of life and hope and the timelessness of God's gift to us. And though we can't assemble at the altar at St. Mark's this evening, I did bring a little bit of St. Mark's here. And that uh, I just was happening to go through some of the, the silver that is part of a gift that was given to me. And, and this particular piece uh, is from our, our Deacon John Maynard's communion set. And I opened it up, and what did I find inside? I, I thought I was being given just a piece of silver, but there was one communion wafer in here. I thought that was very special. So I have this one communion wafer, and I'm going to put it here, symbolic 
of the communion that we all share, even though we're not together physically. We are sharing this communion. And I give you these words as we remember that it is shared on a vast scale. So the topic is Eucharist. The title of the chapter is Throughout All Ages, World Without End. And it begins at the heart of it all is the Eucharistic action. A thing of absolute simplicity, the taking, blessing, breaking, and giving of bread, and the taking, blessing, and giving of a cup of wine and water as they were first done with their new meaning by a monk, young Jew before and after supper with his friends on the night before he died. Soon it was simplified still further by leaving out the supper and combining the double meaning before and after it into a single rite. He had told his friends to do this, henceforth, with new meaning in remembrance of him. And they have done it always since. Was ever another command so obeyed? For century after century, spreading slowly to every continent and country, and among every race on earth, this action has been done. In every conceivable human circumstance, for every conceivable human need, from infancy and before to extreme old age and after it. Men have found no greater things to do for fugitives in the caves and dens of the earth. For kings at their crowning, for criminals going to the scaffold, for armies in triumph, for a bride and bridegroom in a little country church, for the proclamation of a dogma, for a crop of good wheat, for the wisdom of the parliament of a mighty nation, or for a sick old woman afraid to die, for a schoolboy sitting an examination, or for Columbus setting out to discover America. For the famine of whole provinces, for the soul of a dead lover, and thankfulness because my father did not die of pneumonia. For a village headman tempted to return for the repentance of Margaret, for the settlement of a strike, for the son of a barren woman, for Captain so-and-so, wounded and prisoner of war. While well, the lions roared in the nearby amphitheater, on the beach at Dunkirk, while well, the hiss of the scythes and the thick June grass came faintly through the windows of the church. Tremulously, by an old monk, on the 50th anniversary of his vows, furtively by an exiled bishop who had hewn timber all day in a prison camp near Murmansk, 
gorgeously for the canonization of Joan of Arc. One could fill many pages with the reasons why men have done this and not tell a hundredth part of them. Best of all, week by week and month by month, on a hundred thousand successive Sundays, thankfully, unfailingly, across all the parishes of Christendom, the pastors have done just this, to make the plebes sancti day the holy people of God. My dear friends, a holy and blessed week to you all. May the love of God and the grace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all in this and every sacrament tonight and always. This concludes our Monday Thursday observance this evening and invite you to join together again tomorrow night at 7.30 for a meditation on the way of the cross.